And good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to our worship service this Sunday morning. Uh, we've been looking at uh, ways that we can grow in the knowledge of Jesus and ways that we can grow uh, to be better disciples of him, the qualities that we have to grow that way. Uh, we've been looking at a passage in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 to 8. So I'm going to read that again to kind of get our minds around the passage that we've been looking at as essentially our core passage. So it's 2 Peter chapter 1. I'm going to read verses 5 to 8. It says, For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith, goodness, and to goodness, knowledge, and to knowledge, self-control, and to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, mutual affection, and to mutual affection, love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But whoever does not have them is nearsighted and blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their past sins. So that's a passage we've been essentially looking at, is looking at those separate qualities in 2 Peter chapter 1. Our scripture reading this morning is from Titus chapter 2, and I'm going to read verses 11 to 14. So that's Titus chapter 2, verses 11 to 14. It says, For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. While we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our God, our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. So welcome to May. We're starting to get into the summer. Uh, weather's starting to warm up. Uh, everyone wants to get outside. And we were talking a little bit about, about it in our Zoom meeting this morning when we were talking, having our communion. Uh, we're looking forward to some relaxations of the social and physical distancing that we've had to uh, deal with lately. And that's one thing that was pretty exciting to see is that camping is also allowed, is going to be allowed soon. Uh, they're opening up campsites. They're going to uh, allow people to start booking them, or I think in middle of May for the start of June. And I think there's going to be a lot of temptation for many people to go to the parks uh, and have barbecues and gather in groups. There's going to be ways that we can gather and uh, uh, get together, and it's going to be a, a big temptation for people to break those social and physical distancing rules. Uh, in Alberta, so far at least, the rule is 15 people or less, and you have to be more than two meters apart. So we have to have that physical distance, but still be less than 15 people, or yeah, per group. And it's going to take a lot of self-control for people to do what's right, to actually follow those rules and understand that we have to do these things. And I read a quote online, and it's funny how this is attributed to Abraham Lincoln, but it's not. It's just one of those things. It's kind of a catchy quote that said, oh, Abraham Lincoln said this, but he didn't. That's just what the internet's telling us. The quote is, discipline is choosing between what you want now and what you want most. And I think that's very true. Even if Abraham, didn't, didn't say, Abraham Lincoln didn't say it, I think it's a very true thing. We often have to make a choice between what we want now, the immediate gratification, and what we want most, which oftentimes is something that comes down the road if you restrain yourself and have that self-control in the moment. Uh, for me, I heard on the radio they're asking, what are you looking forward to the most when the, the physical distancing measures are over? Uh, for me, the most challenging thing is not touching my face and freaking out. You know, when you go outside and you go shopping, that's all I think about. Don't touch your face. Don't touch your face. You know, you have your, you scratch your nose and you want to, oh, I can't scratch my nose. You got to have that self-discipline, self-control. It takes a lot of strength to really do that. And in our, in our passage in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 to 8, we have that list. And each one of these qualities builds on the last. They all work together. They're, they're essentially that symphony. Uh, and all these qualities sing together. They make a beautiful harmony as we grow as Christians. It starts with that foundation of faith, that strong conviction and trust in both God and Jesus. And then you add to that the quality of virtue. That's that striving for excellence, trying to do your best, trying to do the best you possibly can do to be all that Jesus wants you to be. You increase in knowledge. You gain knowledge. You start to learn things and understand things as you grow through study and experience. Uh, especially regarding the will of God and the path to salvation. And as your knowledge increases, you add to that self-control. Uh, another version, King James Version, translates that as temperance. And that really makes sense, because what good is it to learn all these things, to understand all these things, 
And to grow in the knowledge of what's good and what's evil, what God wants, how to be the best disciple, if we don't have the ability to put those things into practice, to actually put those things into to good use. To do that, you have to have self-control. You have to have that ability to actually carry through with those things that you know you should be doing. We look at the definition of self-control. Uh, in the Greek, the word is enkratia. Again, I'm probably mispronouncing that, but that's the idea. And enkratia means self-control, and that's the virtue of one who masters his desires and passions. And one interesting thing about this Greek word is the root word for that is kratos, which means strength. It takes strength to do this. You have to have a strength to exhibit self-control. And if you have had issues with self-control and, and uh, you know, succumbing to your temptations, you, you will understand that you have to have a lot of strength to really resist uh, either doing what you don't want to do or carrying through what, what you know you should do. So self-control is that discipline as to live uh, in harmony with the knowledge of what is right and wrong. And it's a very important thing. You have to have that ability to carry through with what you know is right or wrong. If you go to Luke chapter 9, we're required to have self-control as disciples of Christ. Now, if you go to Luke chapter 9, we're going to look at verse 23. This idea of denying self is necessary to following Jesus. So if you go to Luke chapter 9, and we'll read verse 23. It says, Then he said to them all, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. If we want to be true disciples of Christ, it comes from the word, it takes discipline. To be a disciple, you have to have discipline. And we have to deny ourselves if we want to follow Christ. There's things that sometimes we want to do, and we have to sometimes swallow that and say, no, we can't do that. If we want to be a disciple of Christ, we have to do what God wants. You cannot be a disciple of Christ without exercising that self-control and exercising that strength to do what you should be doing. But it is challenging. If you go to Romans chapter 7, the challenge, there is a challenge to having self-control, and it's a challenge that's faced by by really all people in every situation. Uh, this is something that we're looking at specifically applying to Christianity and being a disciple of Jesus, but it does apply to every situation. And in Romans chapter 7, we're going to look at verses 21 to 25. This is something where Paul is, is describing the, the challenges that you have in exhibiting self-control. And really, it's, it's a whole section. I'm just going to read a portion of this. But in Romans chapter 7, there's a lot of discussion here that Paul is telling us the, the, the trials of warring against your internal self. But we're going to start in verse 21 of Romans chapter 7. It says, So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God, who delivers me through Christ Jesus our Lord. Paul had a dilemma. He had this dilemma, which I think all of us can relate to, to a certain extent, that you know what you should be doing, but it's very difficult to carry through with that. You have something else working against you. It's, it's almost like those little, I don't know if you've seen those cartoons, the little angel on one side and the little devil on the other side on your shoulders, you know, talking in your ear, saying, do the right thing, do the bad thing. We have that working within ourselves. It's, it's, a, it's a, a war that's going on inside of us between what we know is right and what we really desire to do, you know, doing that bad thing or, or maybe not doing the right thing. Something that we can probably all relate to is that struggle. It's something that you know what you should be doing, but it's so hard to resist. When I'm out shopping, I really want to scratch my nose, but I resist. You know, I try not to do it because that's something that I have to do. And it takes a lot of strength. It takes a lot of self-control. Something you really have to be on point, too. I find that's the worst time is when I'm thinking about something else, then you naturally just do it without even thinking. It's almost an uh, involuntary response to your nose itching. If you go to 1 Corinthians 9, what is the solution to this self-control problem that we have? We have these warring sides within us. Uh, they're doing the right thing and, and not doing the right thing, or wanting to do the right thing and choosing not to do it. We have this warring within it. So how can we make sure we do what we need to do? We take that right action. We exhibit self-control. One thing that I, I find is very true in all this is you have to find out your why. Uh, this is something I've, I've read, again, that applies to a lot of situations. But you have to find out your core desire of why you're on this path. You know, why am I really doing this? Why am I really 
trying to be the best disciple that I can. If we go to 1 Corinthians 9, we're going to read verses 24 to 27. So 1 Corinthians 9, verses 24 to 27. It says, Do you not know that in a race all runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave, so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. So the author here, uh, Paul, is, is describing or making that comparison between an athlete and somebody who's trying to be the best disciple that they can. An athlete has to exercise self-control if they want to win the race. Uh, it takes a lot of stress or strict training to do that. Uh, there's a lot of people out there, I was having this discussion with, uh, with Evan the other day, is that, you know, if you are a top athlete, uh, what do you think makes that top athlete? And of course, natural talent is one of those things. If you look at like the world greats, at the time I was watching a documentary that's on Netflix about uh, Michael Jordan. He's the top basketball player, or was at the time. And he had a lot of natural genetic talent that went into that. But one thing that he had to do, if he had to be number one, there's a lot of people with a lot of talent out there, but they still aren't successful or as successful as somebody like Michael Jordan. He had to exercise self-control. He had to do strict training and work really, really hard to try to get up to that level. And that's the people that make that top, top level is those people that have natural talent and they add to that hard work and training and strict discipline. When they do that, they are going to win the race. They are going to succeed. And that's the same thing we need to do as Christians. If we want to be disciples of Jesus and be the best disciples that we can, we have to be self-disciplined. We have to work hard. We have to train hard to try to put these qualities in the scripture to practice in our lives so that we can be the best we can. So we have to find our why. We have to find out what our motivation is for doing this. It takes a lot of work to, to do these things, to carry through, to exercise that strength. So why are you doing this? Why are you a Christian? Why... Are you doing those things that are difficult to do? Why, are, why do you need to exhibit self-control? I think everyone is going to have a different answer to this. Uh, everybody within themselves will have their own answer to this. Uh, many, is gonna, many people are going to say is that they want to go to heaven. They want to get the crown, just like Paul is saying. You want to get that prize at the end. This brings us back to our scripture reading in Titus chapter 2. It is very true that we have to be obedient to God if we do want to go to heaven, if we want to get that perishable or that imperishable crown. Uh, in verse 27 of the passage we just read, Paul says, I strike a blow to my body and I make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. It's something that we need to, er, uh, we need to be obedient to Jesus as we live our lives. But we have to also remember that we are saved from grace. So Titus chapter 2, starting in verse 11. It says, For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age, while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. I really love this passage because it shows that we are not earning our way in by our actions. God doesn't owe us this. We are saved by grace. Uh, it's Jesus, through his sacrifice, his blood cleanses us of our sins. He purifies for himself a people that are his very own. He purifies us from all wickedness. So why do you follow the COVID guidelines? Again, we have these things that are imposed on us by the government. Why do you follow them? Do you do it just because the government tells you to do it? Or do you do it because you really want to stop the virus and help others? Are you looking at the reason the government is putting these things in place and following them for that same reason? Or are you just following the rules? Once they stop the rules, you're not going to do it anymore. I, this makes reminds me of, of when you're a kid and say you hit your sister. Sorry, Melinda. Do you apologize? Your parents say, apologize to your sister. Do you apologize just because your parents told you to? You say, yeah, sure, I'm sorry. Yeah. Or you do it because you're really sorry. Why are you following the rules? Why are you following these guidelines? And if you apply that to God, why are we obedient to God? Are we grudgingly following the rules? 
Are we grudgingly following these things that God is teaching us in the scriptures, or we really do we really want to please him and do good? This is where it's going to be uh, important, because when things get tough, when it's really tough to follow through with what God wants you to do, if you reflect back on your why, why am I doing this? If you really want to please God, you're going to be able to take that next step and do the right thing. If you're simply just trying to follow the rules, you're going to have a harder time doing that. It's not going to uh, give you that motivation to carry and follow through. I think this verse really does show uh, how we are to live these self-controlled lives because of the grace that's given to us. Again, we should be eager to, go, to do good, but not because we're earning our way in, but we're eager to do good because it's the right thing to do. We want to please God. We want to do the things that God is teaching us to do. We want to do that because that's our why. We want to please Him because of the grace that He has shown to us. When things get hard, you are going to have to dig deep. And if you know why you are doing it, you can pull through and resist the temptation that you're experiencing at that time. When it's tough to follow through, if you know exactly why you're doing it, you can carry through. So how do we battle against temptation? How can we resist when we want to do something, when we know we should not do it? Or if you look at it the other way, how can we follow through with what we know we should do if we don't want to do it? it works both ways. Uh, I'm a math guy, so I like putting these things into formulas. And I really like this. Temptation equals desire plus opportunity. So if you have temptation, it takes desire. You have to want to do it. If it's something that you shouldn't be doing and you want to do it, that's the desire. If you didn't have that desire, there wouldn't be any temptation. There would be no reason to, to try to carry through with that bad thing or that thing that you shouldn't be doing. Also, you have to have the opportunity to do it. If you don't have the opportunity, you can't take advantage of this thing that you shouldn't be doing. But if you take away that opportunity, you can't have temptation either. So temptation equals desire plus opportunity. Then if you add in that next stage of action, that results in sin. Temptation leads only to sin when you yield and act upon it. If you have the desire and the opportunity, but you resist, you hold back, that means that you are successful. You've resisted the temptation. But if you carry through, that's action. So again, if you put that in mathematical terms, sin equals desire plus opportunity plus action, where you carry through with that thing that you shouldn't be doing. There's always that desire to stray from God. We have that warring within ourselves, those, those, that battle within. And it takes practice to really change the desire. If we want to remove the desire from ourselves, it takes practice. You have to have those habits to be doing the right thing. As time goes on and we put these things to practice in our lives, the things that are taught to us in the scriptures, we're going to see the benefits and eventually that desire to sin is going to drop off. Uh, I used to drink my coffee with sugar. That was something I really liked, especially when I was in university. Uh, whenever I had an exam, I would go out and get the Tim Hortons that was on campus and get a double-double. And that was two, two creams and two sugars. I just loved it. But I wouldn't do it normally because that's too much sugar for me. So I decided one time, I said, okay, I'm going to stop having sugar in my diet. So I'm going to cut off the sugar in my coffee. So when I first started doing that and drinking this coffee without sugar, it was kind of like, eh, it's all right, I guess. But after a while, after practicing it, I started seeing the benefits. I wasn't getting kind of that crash after I had my coffee in the morning because of that sugar spike that you would have. And I started not even wanting sugar in my coffee. So I'm at the point now in my life where if I put sugar in my coffee, it doesn't taste good. I don't like it. So I don't have that desire to put sugar in my coffee anymore. And the same thing can work as we live Christian lives. As we put these things to practice, we study God's word and we see how it works in our lives. And we see that it's better to do the right thing. It's better to live that moral life. We're not going to want to do the bad things. That desire is going to be gone. So we can really focus on doing what God wants and making that our why, making sure that we desire to please him. And then we eventually uh, take that desire away and we nip it in the bud. We don't have that temptation to begin with. Another thing we can do, sometimes you, you have that desire. There's nothing, it's very difficult to stop that at times. So what can you do if you want to remove that temptation? Limit your opportunities. Uh, again, remember, we're only tempted when there's both desire and opportunity. So say you have the desire. That's realistic. That's what we have. We're, we're humans. We're going to have desires to do something that's not correct or not the right thing to do. So how do you limit your opportunities? Uh, while we work on changing the desires, we can limit our opportunities to fulfill those wrongful desires. We can limit those opportunities to do the wrong thing. So it's really purposefully avoiding situations that might induce those wrongful desires. If you go to Psalm 101, if you go to the Old Testament, and we're going to look at uh, we're going to look at a passage that was written by David. It's a psalm written by David. If you go to Psalm 101, 
We're going to read verses 3 to 4. So Psalm 101, starting in verse 3. So David writes, I will not look with approval on anything that is vile. I will hate what is faithful or faithless people do. I will have no part in it. The perverse of heart shall be far from me. I will have nothing to do with what is evil. David is putting that distance between what is vile and what is evil. He's putting that distance between him and that thing. He's removing that opportunity. And if you know you have a weakness, avoid putting yourself in the situation where it would be easy to succumb to it. Uh, since these physical distancing things have, have started, and, and at the grocery store, it's, it's a little bit more tedious to go grocery shopping. Uh, there's times where I would just, you know, after work, and say, oh, we need some milk. So I just stop at the Sobeys and grab some milk and come home. But now we're really making a point to only shop once a week, to try to limit our time at the store, kind of for different reasons. Uh, again, they, they say that that's one way that you can prevent the spread of the, of the germs, is limit your uh, exposure to other people. And also, I don't really want to go to the store. It's kind of a hassle now. You know, I got to make all these preparations. I can't touch my face the whole time. So I just try to limit that to once a week. So one thing I find that's difficult is that since we're shopping once a week, we'll buy a whole bunch of food that's supposed to last us throughout the whole week. And it's temptation because it's all right there. Uh, I have a hard time not eating all of the Oreos that we buy for the whole week, all in one sitting. This morning was even a, a bad example, where it's a good example for the, for the illustration, bad example for me, where I had Oreos at the table. I ate probably 10 Oreos this morning with milk because I knew that they were just sitting right there. I can have them. But the easiest way to avoid eating too much of one food is just don't have it in the house. Limit that opportunity. Uh, right now we can't do that or we're choosing not to do that by shopping once a week but that's one thing that you can do in, in your life if, it's, if you have something that you know is going to entice you to do the wrong thing and it gives you, you have that desire to do it take away that opportunity if you go to 1 Corinthians 15 1 Corinthians chapter six, uh, 15 sometimes it's, it's removing yourself from situations and also you can be removing yourselves from certain people David, in the same way, he was uh, putting that distance between himself and what was evil. And we also, as Christians, should be avoiding those whose evil behavior encourages us to sin with them. If you go to 1 Corinthians 15, and verse 33, pretty short verse, but a very wise verse, a very good verse to put into practice in your life. So 1 Corinthians 15, 33 says, Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. If you have friends that tend to lead you down the wrong path, the best thing to do is avoid those friends. Again, it's a very hard thing to do, especially if they're very close, but if you know that they're going to lead you down that path, it's best for you to stay away from those people. They are going to influence you. Again, hopefully you can influence them. The converse of this is also true, where good company can, can improve or influence good character in other people too. But if you're really having a tough time with doing a certain action, then you might have to stay away from that situation. You might have to stay away from those people. One thing, again, if we want to be realistic, it's very unlikely that we are going to remove out of our lives every desire to do the wrong thing and every opportunity to sin in this life. There are going to be times where you're going to have temptation. The desire is going to be there or the opportunity is going to be there. So what can you do then? The one thing that you can remember is that we do have God on our side in this. You might think sometimes that it's impossible to control your own actions. Uh, I've heard people say, oh, that's just me. That's just what I do. You know, I don't think that's true. I think that you're choosing to do what you want to do. You have a lot of natural impulses and a lot of natural uh, inclinations to do certain things, but those things can be changed. We do have control and we can do things. We can make that choice to either do the right thing or choose not to do the wrong thing. Remember the root of the Greek word of self-control is strength. You have to have that strength. And... There are things that are seemingly impossible to avoid or prevent. Again, food is one thing for me. I, I have a really hard time with kind of the binge eating. If I have a good full week and I can kind of keep with that routine for a full week, uh, the workday is kind of easy because I remove myself from home and I'm at the office. At the office, I bring my lunch. It's a precise lunch. That's all I eat during the day because that's all I have. I don't have that opportunity. But there can be times where you have that desire and you have that opportunity can be very hard to resist. Uh, it's, it's hard, but it's not impossible. That's one thing that we can really hang on to. If you go to Ephesians chapter 3, when we become Christians, we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. 
In Ephesians chapter 3, I'm going to read a couple of verses in the chapter. And the Holy Spirit is God's instrumental agent who imparts strength to us. We get that strength from the Holy Spirit that resides within us. If you go to Hebrews chapter 3, we're going to read verse 16 and then go down to verse 20. So starting in verse 16. This is Paul writing here. Paul says, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his Holy Spirit in your inner being. If you go down to verse 20, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. When we are strengthened by the Spirit, we can resist. This is the power that created the universe. Uh, this is a power that that spoke the universe into existence. We have access to this power. This is the Holy Spirit that resides within us. One thing that we can always remember to do, as Paul did when he wrote in verse 16 in Ephesians 3, he says, I pray. We can pray too. We can pray to God when we have those times of weakness. We can use that Holy Spirit. We can use the strength that he's given to us. If you go to Philippians chapter 2, equally important, we have to act upon what the strength that we have. We have to trust that we are not alone as we do God's will. If you go to Philippians 12, we're going to read verses 12 and 13. It says, Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. The Holy Spirit provides strength from within and also provides us the word to follow, the word of God. As we practice, we develop that self-control. God is with us while we try. We have that indwelling of the Holy Spirit. We have that strength as we strive, as we keep rolling through and putting these things to practice in our lives. Uh, there's a certain, uh, certain uh, athletic brand out there that's got a slogan that probably everybody recommend, recognizes. Just do it. That's one thing that we just have to do is just carry through. Just do it. We have the strength to do it. If you think, oh, it's just me. I can't do that. You, you can. You have the strength to do this. God is providing you the strength to do it. And in some cases, we can kind of mix that phrase around and we say, just don't do it. If we're trying to resist the temptation to do something, we have the strength to do these things. We have the choice to make. And we can do it. We have the strength to do it. You go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. This is a very encouraging verse and also a very challenging verse because it really shows us that we have the choice when things get really tough, when we have that temptation in front of us. We have that desire, we have that opportunity, and we have the choice now whether or not we're going to take action. 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 13 it says, No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. God has provided us with all the tools and all the strength necessary to stop the temptation in its tracks. We can stop this. We have the strength to do it. We just have to choose to do it, to take that right action. Remember, we're saved by grace. We're going to make mistakes. And really, that's part of this power of God that's within us. He's continually cleansing us when we make those mistakes. Our responsibility is to look for those ways out and look for those ways to resist the temptation and do the right thing. To have that self-control, to exhibit that self-control, and to practice self-control. After time, it is going to get a bit easier, but it's never going to be something that's going to be 100% solved. You're always going to have uh, a certain struggle with uh, doing the right thing or choosing not to do the wrong thing. You're going to have that choice at all times. But we have the power of God within us. We have that power of God through His Holy Spirit. We have power of God through what he's given to us in the scriptures and putting those things to practice in our lives and get, developing those habits so it's easier and easier to do the right thing. And when we do fail, we have the power of grace to cleanse us from those mistakes that we do make. We can learn self-control. We can add it to our faith, virtue, and knowledge to be the best disciples that we can be. Controlling yourself is a natural component to growing in the knowledge of Jesus. Uh, faith is our foundation, that belief that God... Uh, is true, that he's giving us the right things, and we can trust in the things that he's telling us. Virtue is that striving for excellence. That's part of the desire, part of doing the right thing and desiring to do the right thing. And as we continually increase in knowledge as we study, we use self-control to put that knowledge into action, to act on what we have learned. 
you learned a really good piece of knowledge, it doesn't do you any good unless you take advantage of that knowledge and put it into action. Self-control is required if you want to be a disciple of Christ, and it can be developed. You can find out what your why is. God has saved us through grace. Find out why you really want to be a Christian. Why do you really want to be a disciple of Christ? We should want to serve him because what he has done for us. Uh, that will provide us that motivation when you find out your internal reason as to why you are a Christian. That'll push you through when it's hard to exhibit self-control, when it's hard to put those things into practice. Resist temptation. Temptation is that desire plus opportunity, and sin is following through. You add that action to it. Practice serving God, and hopefully you'll remove that desire to stumble. If the desire is there, try to limit your opportunities to sin. Try to do that. That's something that you can take active action on, is to remove those opportunities. When desire and opportunity is there, remember that you do have God on your side. He is helping us. He's doing all he can to help us make the right decision. He's not making the decision for us, but he's helping us make that decision ourselves. The creator of the universe it has given us the strength to resist, to take that right step, to exhibit self-control and that strength. We have strength from within ourselves, and we have the strength that God has given us. I'd like to offer an invitation. Uh, if you're listening to this and you have not yet taken that step to accept Jesus as your Lord, uh, please contact either me. You can do it through the comments. You can do it through a private message. Uh, you can even go to our website and send us an email through our email address. And we can help as much as we can to show you how to accept that gift of, of salvation that God has offered to all. So you can access this power that all of us have. And if you're a Christian, please, again, make your needs known. We are going through a tough time now where it might be tough to be dealing with this situation. Uh, please make your needs known and we can help in any way that we can. I'd like to close now and offer a closing word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time we have to, to uh, present these lessons uh, uh, through the world on the internet. And I thank you for giving us this opportunity to do that. I uh, pray that the message that we spoke today was, was true and honest and according to your word and your scriptures. And pray that there's people out there that can accept that and learn from that and learn how to uh, take hold of the power that you provided to us and the strength that we have access to in exhibiting self-control and we want to uh, stray from you. Pray that we can use that strength to exhibit self-control to stay on the right path. I'd like to, to help us get through the rest of this week and through the rest of this crisis and pray for those who are struggling right now and I pray that you can help them get through that as quickly as possible. Again, I thank you for this opportunity we have. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, thank you for joining us and uh, be safe and be well.